Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about some of the, the work I've been doing trying to integrate uh, molecular developmental and paleontological data and try to come up with a more holistic view of, of gene regulatory network evolution, especially in the context of time. Um, so this is, this is a little bit of a, it's kind of a next step after a paper that we published a couple months ago, uh, trying to integrate this kind of approach. Um, and so first off, before we really get into it, I, I have to talk about what are gene regulatory networks. And so the, these are the interactions of, of numerous, numerous different genes in development uh, that interact together to, to form the morphological structures that we see through the regulation of proteins. And, you know, I, echinoids are the best. Um, and it just so happens that the best gene regulatory network for development is known in echinoids, specifically uh, the purple sea urchin, Strongylus and Trotus purpuratus. So that allows us to do a lot of cool things. Um, and now when I talk about gene regulatory networks, what I'm talking about is, uh, let, like let's say we have this 16, stage, 16 cell stage, excuse me, embryo right here. We have gene one expressed in one of these um, uh, macromeres and uh, gene one is then responsible for for regulating the activity, so for kicking off the expression of gene two. Now gene two is being expressed later in development, but it's being expressed in the cells that arise from this uh, blast, bleh, excuse me, this macromere. Um, and then let's say later in development, gene two regulates the expression of genes three, four, and five later on in development. Now in, in addition to being responsible for the activation, the, the starting of expression of genes, uh, this can also work in the opposite where you repress genes. And this is, uh, in the diagrams I'll be showing, this is essentially, you know, if it's a little arrow, it means that the gene downstream of gene 2 is being extressed in it, and if it's this little thing, that means that gene 2 is uh, keeping gene 3 from being expressed. It's repressing its expression. Um, and also, I have to talk a little bit about echinoid embryology if I'm going to talk about echinoid gene regulatory networks. Um, and so this is a 16-cell euechinoid uh, embryo. Uh, the most important thing for, for what I'm going to be talking about today are these guys right down here in the blue at the, the vegetal pole of the cell. These are the micromeres. They're small, thus micro. Um, oh, I went the wrong direction. And this is a sideroid embryo. So uh, we have two major uh, subclasses of echinoids. Well, two subclasses of echinoids in post -paleozoic, the sideroids and the euechinoids. Uh, they both have micromeres. However, sideroid micromeres are irregular in number, so you can see there's three down here, and they're irregular in size. So I say there's three, there could be anywhere from zero to four in sideroids. It's variable, whereas in euechinoids, we always have a consistent four um, at the vegetable pole. And also, I need to talk a little bit about NC2 hybridization. This is just a way we're able to localize where the expression of a gene is occurring by looking at the, the RNA that is encoded from that gene. Um, so essentially where you see the purple, and this will be the case throughout the talk, the purple is where the gene is expressed. Um, so like let's say we're looking at echinoid embryos here, the purple, this is where the genes are being expressed. In this case, this is the gene VEGFR. One last thing I need to tell you, I'm going to be using some gene names today. Don't worry about it. They're really irrelevant. The more important thing is what the gene does. So don't worry about the, the gene names. Um, now, something maybe some of you have, have seen, I know at least one of you in the audience has seen it because um, he published it, but this is our uh, post-Paleozoic echinoid phylogeny. Um, these are the sideroids over here, and these are all euechinoids. And if I light it up for you, it really shows you there's, there's quite a striking uh, taxonomic and morphological disparity uh, between the two. The, the euechinoids are, are really diverse uh, morphologically and taxonomically, while the sideroids are, are quite conserved um, and much less so. Um, and here is a good old <coughs> sideroid and a euechinoid. This is Strongulus and Trotus purpuratus. This is what we have our, our very well understood gene regulatory network for. And this is Eusideris tribuloides, um, which, is a, uh, which is a sideroid echinoid and uh, a new developing model organism. Um, and these both form, well, thank you. Um, although if they're coming in here, let them on in. But um, <laughs> these both form uh, a larval or embryonic skeleton. It's larval in a sideroid, embryonic in a euechinoid. Um, this is our sideroid, this is our euechinoid. See, they both form these uh, high magnesium calcium carbonate skeletons, which you can see here, you can see it here as well. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is, is the gene regulatory networks underlying the, uh, the formation of the skeleton and how that's different in these two taxa. Um, and that comes from very recent work by my good friend Eric Erkenbrack and, and the recently sadly deceased Eric Davidson, um, looking 
at the differences between uh, the uh, gene regulatory networks underlying early skeletogenesis and the formation of the PMCs, which make the skeleton, uh, in euechinoids and sideroids. Um, and now I want to talk about that mechanism a little bit. So uh, in euechinoids, the way that the, the, the micromeres are formed and then eventually give rise to the skeleton is through what we call the, the double negative gate, which I'm abbreviating DNG. So what that means, uh, and I'll explain it, is we have the expression of this first gene, PMAR1, occurring in the micromeres. Um, and you can see from the in situ hybridization, it's down here in the micromeres. Uh, however, in the rest of the embryo, the PMR1 is not being expressed. Um, now, in the rest of the embryo, however, a little bit later in development, we have the expression of this gene PMR1. And now, what's important is that, or excuse me, I said HESI, not PMR1. Um, now, what's important here is that PMR1 uh, represses HESC. So, everywhere that PMR1 was expressed at the 16 cell stage now is not, uh, is not expressing HESC. And that's because HESC is being repressed by PMR1. Uh, now, furthermore, uh, even later in development, we get the expression of, of numerous genes, but just four are shown here, uh, in those cells where PMAR1 was expressed. Now, that's because this is a double repression mechanism. We have a repressor, which is PMAR1, repressing another repressor, which is HESC. And so because of that, you get the genes that are downstream of HESC being expressed later in development. Now, we know this is what happens in euechinoids. We know this is how they form their primary uh, mesenchymal cells, which make the skeleton. Um, however, it's recently been demonstrated that the double negative gate is not present in sideroids, um, and not just one sideroid, which is what most model organism work deals with, but actually two of them, um, Prionosideris baculosa from Japan and Eusideris tribuloides. Um, and we know that it doesn't exist because we have overlapping expression patterns of, of HES-C, as you can see here, and genes which are downstream of that in the euechinoid, uh, in this case, T-brain and that's one And so that tells us that hes cannot be repressing these genes. Um, furthermore, we know that PMAR1, which is that initial input into the euechinoid double negative gate, is not present in the genome of uh, Eusideris tribuloides. Um, so we know that the, the double negative gate is not present there. But what I'm interested in is when do these changes occur? How can we use the fossil record and other evidence of dating to determine when these evolutionary changes in gene regulatory networks took place? So these two papers, um, Erkin, Bracken, Davidson, and a paper headed up by myself that came out earlier, um, attributed this, this uh, change in GRNs to the divergence. But what I'm trying to do now is let's look at this a bit more rigorously. Uh, how can we test these hypotheses with respect to the data that we have? So to do that, we can look at the fossils. This is this is a bit basic with compared to some of the methods that people use now, and I, I will be incorporating those in the future. But for now, let's just assume that if we have two taxa, A and B and their sister taxa, um, that the divergence of these two taxa took place before B, uh, before the appearance of B in the fossil record. Um, so with respect to the, the work published by Erkin, Brack, and Davidson, they uh, and myself, we used the, the oldest sideroid, so this guy, to date the timing of this to um, the late Permian, especially that of the Guadalupe Mountains, which you can see here, which is where this taxon, which is the oldest sideroid, Eotiris guadalupensis, this is where it was, uh, where it was found. Um, and we use that to essentially constrain the difference uh, in the, the divergence of these two GRNs down here into the Guadalupian about 268 million years ago. But let's move forward from that. Um, let's, let's try and incorporate multiple different types of data into how we can constrain this change. And to do that, we can use uh, phylogenetic data. And I'll be using the, the uh, phylogeny published by Smith et al. 2006, which is total evidence in nature, uh, developmental data, much of which I've shown you already, and paleontological data. So let's use the fossils to get it at constraining timing. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the phylogeny I'll be, I'll be dealing with here. Um, and I would like to first point out, here's Strongulus introtus purpuratus. So this is the taxon that the double negative gate was first described in. This is what we know uh, most about the, the, this is the echinoid that we know the most about with respect to gene regulatory networks. And we know the double negative gate is there. Furthermore, in addition to, if we zoom in on uh, this particular portion of this topology, we know through the fact that, that there's two molecular labs and they work on the same taxon and that they do treat them as if they're the same exact thing even though there's not, we know that the double negative gate is also present in Lidokinus variegatus. Um, so we might say that we can, uh, oh, sorry, I keep hitting back. We might say that with the data we have, we can, we can at least make an assumption now that 
this may have been present in the last common ancestor of these two taxa. Uh, but these are just two taxa, and so let's try and think about looking elsewhere uh, on the, the euechinoid tree. And so to do that, we can step out. Um, and now we have developmental data for, for a few uh, euechinoids, especially with respect to the double negative gate. Um, and another one of those is Scaphicinus mirabilis, also from Japan. It's not within one of these clades, but it's, it's a scutellid, so it, it plots quite closely here on the tree. So I'm just using it there, for instance, because we, we didn't have the data for this taxon at the time of publication. Um, but let's see if we have evidence for the double negative gate in this taxon. And if we look at the 16 cell stage and we look at the expression of Hess C, um, which remember is that second repressor in the double negative gate, the expression patterns at the 16 cell stage, you can see here, line up very closely, pretty much exactly, with what we see in Strongulus and Trotus purpuratus. Um, now, if we look at other genes, for instance, PMAR1, we see that very stereotypical expression right down here in the micromeres, uh, which is really great. And we have PMAR1. That's a difference between uh, sideroids right off the bat because they don't have it in their genome. Um, and finally, if we can look at ALX1, which is downstream of HESC, we see it being expressed in the cells um, that, the, uh, that the, the micromeres would have given rise to. So this supports our hypothesis that the double negative gate may have been present uh, in at least the last common ancestor of this taxon and those that we looked at earlier. And so if we look at the expression patterns, this is, this is, what, we, this is what we can see now that, is indi that indicates evidence of the double negative gate being in this taxon. So with that in mind, we might say we have it here. Um, but where else can we look on this tree? Uh, we can look in the Lavinia day, um, and we can look at uh, Echinocardium chordatum, which is uh, also this particular individual was from Japan as well, and they see the same kind of evidence. We see PMR1 expressed in the small micromeres, has he expressed everywhere outside of the small micromere lineage, so it's not being expressed down there, and ALX1 expressed very strongly in the cells that uh, the micromeres gave rise to. So this also is really good evidence that the double negative gate is likely present and acting in a chitocordium chordatum. So with that in mind, we might, we might put this, this little green thing which I'm using to represent the idea that the double negative gate may be present. That's definitely open to testing in the future, of course. Um, we might put that down here at the divergence of these two clades. And furthermore, because this is all the developmental data that we have, and I would say we have pretty good sampling with respect to a number of taxa and echinoids, um, that the double negative gate was at least with the developmental data, probably at least present in the last common ancestor of these taxa. And now this is where the fossils come in. Oh, I'm sorry, I should point out, uh, these are the sideroids over here. So uh, with that in mind, uh, Erkenbrack and Davidson looked at this taxon and this and said, okay, the, the difference in these, the evolution of this mechanism of gene regulation must have occurred at their last common ancestor. What I'm showing right now is we don't have the developmental data to say that for sure because we haven't looked at all these taxa right here. So, you know, they would put it down here, but where should we put it? Um, we can look at these two clades and use the fossil record to constrain uh, the youngest date at which the last common ancestor of these taxa lived. Um, and that uh, would be this guy. This is the, the uh, Jesse and Echinus. It's the oldest irregular echinoid, um, which means it's the oldest uh, representative of this clade right here. Um, and this occurs in the New York Canyon member of the Sunrise Canyon Formation, which is early Jurassic in age. This is from Nevada in the western US. You can see this is my co-author for scale. She's about five feet. Ooh, <laughs> well, that's maybe like what? 1.6 meters. I'm, um, I'm in the wrong country. I'm sorry. Um, but, and that tells us uh, this taxon is about 189.6 million years old. So it's early Jurassic. Um, and so that tells us that we might rigorously say that uh, the, this particular piece of gene regulatory network apparatus, this double negative gate, could have evolved at least by 189.6, you know, give or take million years ago, as opposed to 268, which is the number that had been put out previously. Um, so I'm saying right now, let's go with the more rigorous estimate here as opposed to just looking at two taxa and assuming, uh, which are very far separated with respect to phylogenetic distance, and let's just assume that whatever differences is there uh, occurred with the divergence of them. This probably seems quite logical to all of you. Um, so uh, in conclusion, uh, we can at least date the appearance of this double negative gate, this uh, particular <coughs> piece of gene regulatory network topology to uh, 189.6 million years ago, based on the presence of this fossil, Jesse Nakakinus hawkinsi. 
Uh, but what's next? This is very preliminary data. Um, it's more of a framework. Uh, I'd like to quantify these divergences a little bit better using fossil calibrated uh, molecular divergence dating. And furthermore, uh, we've been working on a new, uh, another taxon. It's a diatomatoid uh, echinoid, Centrus tephanus coronatus, which plots down here. We've done RNA-seq, um, and I'm hoping to do some perturbation experiments to establish whether or not the double negative gate is present there uh, in this coming summer. So with that said, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Eric Davidson for, I mean, really getting me thinking about these sorts of things. And additionally, uh, our collaborators in the Davidson Lab um, and the National Science Foundation of the U.S. Thank you.